my name is Marty Quinn, and welcome to the Climate Symphony. Now, some of you may be saying to yourselves, I didn't know the climate could play music. Or maybe, where did it take lessons? What conservatory did it attend? What instruments does it play? And some may even say that the climate already is a kind of symphony. And if you include its, if you consider its daily warm-ups and exercises, I would have to agree the climate already is a kind of symphony. And what instruments does it play? Well, surely the climate plays percussion. One just has to think about the crack of lightning or the rolling thunder of an earthquake. What about the rhythmic patter of rain? Some hear music in the rainforest. Others in the washing of the waves on the beach. Some hear music in the tinkling of the icicles on the trees outside. What about the sound of 200-foot glacial cliffs as they fall into the Arctic Sea? Or the rushing roar of a tornado? Still, the climate never took lessons. It never played in a big band. Well, maybe not a big band. But what about the Big Bang? Does that count? self-taught, most likely, and very inspiring. Yes, there is inspiration all around us, and even inside us, in your own heartbeat. In our genetic makeup. In the smile of a friend. Is this the music of our sphere? The music that comes out of the interaction of elements or that arises out of our emotions, our love, our longing, our sadness, our striving, our joy? Or is there another music of our planet that is just out of reach, just out of hearing, like the sounds elephants recognize, but which to us are too low to hear? But if we could hear this music, what would it sound like? Or what biorhythms are being played by this great Earth of ours? What astronomical and geophysical cycles of nature are there to be heard? Indeed, this climate symphony contains rhythms whose time signatures span not seconds, but lifetimes. Imagine yourself in the choir of such a symphony. How long would I have to hold this note for? In fact, the measures of the Climate Symphony last anywhere from 10 lifetimes up to 1,000 lifetimes. Nay, over 100,000 years. This is the symphony you will hear today. I met Dr. Paul Mayevsky, the Ice Man, about five years ago when I was invited to attend a talk at his home just down the street from where we lived in New Hampshire. I was told that Paul was the director of the Climate Change Research Center at the University of New Hampshire, and that he would be giving a talk on his travels and research in Greenland as part of the Greenland Ice Core project. I had heard that Paul was involved with glaciers, and I was curious to find out more about it, and so I decided to go. This is what the ice man said. It all began 110,000 years ago in the center of Greenland. It was so cold that when it snowed, the snow would never melt. As each flake fell, 
it would carry into its frozen kingdom part of whatever happened to be in the air at the time. For you see, as the wind raced across the oceans, it would pick up the smell of the sea. And as the wind roamed over the hills and valleys and coastlines, it would pick up the dust of the earth, the dust of life. It would carry volcanic ash into its frozen tomb to be remembered forever as a trace of its past fiery glory. It would even carry traces of the sun's light as it waxes and wanes in its polyrhythmic dance of atomic fire. Each year, the snow would fall on the prior year's snow and build up layers and layers and layers and layers, just like the layers of growth you can see in the rings of a tree. As the snow fell, it started to get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And the snow on the bottom would get more and more compressed until after 110,000 years, the snow was as high as a mountain and two miles thick. Then, beginning in 1989, the Iceman along with a group of researchers from around the world, began to drill down into this mountain of ice and extracted a column nearly two miles long. As each piece was extracted, they began to analyze what the ice had stored away for us, waiting to tell us, forever holding in its icy embrace traces of what the climate was like across the breadth of time. And what were these traces? The Iceman presented a slide showing the ups and downs of the chemical residues found in the ice core. After further mathematical analysis, they were able to determine what natural forces seemed to be causing the climate. As I looked at all this data, all I saw was so many squiggly lines. I felt that it should be more, that it didn't convey the beauty of the Earth, the life of the Earth. I felt like it should be more, like it should be experienced, like it should be music. But the question to me was, how do you portray the patterns in nature using patterns in music? You see, that's the problem. I mean, solution. I mean, how do you take information that resides in data files and that are represented by numbers that might be positive and negative, like our left and right hands, and that might be related to one another, like you and I are related or unrelated, or that have come from sensors or analysis, and that have incredible ranges of values, and that might represent time or measurements of all kinds into music. How do you do that? Well, it's simple, really. We can assign the lowest value in a file to be the lowest pitch in a scale and the highest value in a file to be the highest pitch in a scale, and assign notes in between to represent values in between. see how this can be applied to the ice core data. The Iceman's drill removes a portion of the ice from the ice sheet. and it is cut in various lengths and cataloged. Each piece is ultimately examined in 50 different ways, 10 of which alone determine the year in which the ice was formed. 
Each piece is tested for the chemical traces that it contains. And remember that if we know the origins of these chemical traces, they can tell us about conditions on Earth at the time they were deposited in the snow. To convert this data into music, we'll convert concentration levels to pitch. The higher the concentration, the higher the pitch. The lower the concentration, the lower the pitch. Now, we'll also, to differentiate one chemical from the rest, we'll use a different instrument sound. Remember the story? As the wind blew over the sea, it picked up the salts of the sea in the form of sodium. And chloride. There's sodium. And there's chloride. As it roamed over the land, it picked up calcium in the form of limestone dust. And magnesium. Forest fires generate ammonium. Nitrate and potassium. And finally, forests and finally, volcanoes generate sulfates. Now, let's listen to a portion of the data after we convert it to music. We're going to listen to a small portion about 14,000 years ago to about 12,000 years ago. This little part right here. This is the whole 100,000 years right here, 110,000 years. So 14,000 years ago, we had an event called, that's become known as the Younger Dryas event, during which time the Earth suddenly got quite a bit colder. Now, each note you hear represents five years in time. We're starting over here and moving this way. You hear that? That's the temperatures getting colder, the high pitches. Now listen and raise your hands when you hear the temperatures warm up again and the pitches get lower. Very good, very good. Very good. So we know that we can convert concentration levels to pitch and differentiate those pitches using different instruments. What else is possible? The next slide represents knowledge that the scientists acquired from studying the chemical series found in the ice core. Ice core. They recognized regular patterns in the climate. Yeah, thanks that were as long as over 70,000 years to as short as 550 years. For, for instance, they could see that every 6,300 years or so, the ice sheets moved down and up over the Earth's surface. They could see the effect of the changing tilt of the Earth over about a 40,000 year cycle. And they could tell that the change in the elliptical orbit of the Earth around the sun, the slight change, 
caused about 45% of the climate signature. I challenge myself to come up with a way to turn these patterns of nature into patterns of music. Let me introduce you to the elements of the climate symphony. When the sun's intensity is low, you will hear not just a scale of pitches, but a scale of melodic patterns based on the data values. As the intensity starts to increase, so does the pitch and the complexity of the melodic pattern. As it increases further, and still further, Every 550 years, you will hear that change. Next, the ebb and flow of the ice sheets I chose to represent as a scale of rhythmic patterns instead of melodic patterns. This time we have rhythmic patterns. And we have two sets, one for when the ice sheet is fully down on the Earth's surface. As it starts to retreat, then when it gets about midway, it turns into drum patterns. signify dancing and to signify metallic qualities of ice or the hardness of ice. That's why I chose those sounds. For the volcanic activity, which is the sulfates, I chose to represent that through two sounds. One is crash cymbals and the other are very big timpani drums. The lower and louder the timpani drums the bigger the eruption. Now, look at that spike in the middle, and remember that spike in the middle. OK. I don't have a sound for that one. For the wobble of the Earth, this is the, the, uh, called the, the precession of the Earth, where some summers are hotter than others, and some winters are colder than others. We have a sound that is a, like an organ, beautiful sustained tone the lower two octaves of a keyboard. That's at 22,000 years. There's a subharmonic of the wobble at about 11,000 years that takes the right two octaves. Because it moves twice as fast, it's very musical, like a melody changing with a bass line changing half as fast. The wobble of the earth. For the tilt of the earth, so as, this, as the earth is spinning and wobbling, it's also tilting, changing in its tilt orientation. And that's about a 40,000 year cycle. Now for that, you'll hear three note arpeggios, a scale of five sets, one, two, three, four, five, sets of three note arpeggios that sound like this. As the tilt starts to increase, the pitch of the arpeggio also starts to increase. top tilt. Okay. Next. 
And finally, we have the over 70,000 year cycle that is the change in the elliptical shape of the Earth as it orbits the Sun. Now that will transpose all of the other data files, all the other music created by the data files, up seven semitones, or back down. And that's the, that's the actual data that you see in the wave there. So over the whole course of the piece, it transposes up and then transposes back down. OK. We're ready to hear the Climate Symphony. Ready to play the Climate Symphony. We'll begin 110,000 years back in time and travel at the rate of 50 years per beat. We'll begin slowly at first. At about 150 years per second for the first two minutes or 20,000 years. Then we'll increase speed to about 350 years a second for the rest of the piece. Ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seat belts and put your tray tables in the upright and locked position and your minds in the unlocked position. The arsonic flight, arsonic journey through the ice core will take a little over seven minutes. We hope you enjoy the trip, the climate symphony.
climate symphony. Did you hear those last three notes? Da da da. Just the last 150 years. This data set did not include the effects of human activity, basically. Um, but what will the effects of our human activity be on the music of the Climate Symphony? Hopefully a positive one. I'd like to thank the University of New Hampshire, the scientists at the University of New Hampshire, and all of the scientists around the world who helped make access to this data possible and who helped to bring us this uh, data which can give us a better glimpse of this wonderful Earth of ours. There we go. All right, the Seismic Sonata was created for the Iris Cons Consortium in Washington. That they're the people that collect seismic data from all around the world. And they gave me a, a challenge to say, in our museum displays, we have these machines that sh allow the people to say, I want to replay the 1994 Northridge, California earthquake. And they see these three machines, you know, writing out the seismic waves. One from where it happened, near Pasadena. One from uh, Albuquerque. And one from Harvard. And at first, I was given a file with all of these seismic signals in it. And I did up a sonification. And the end result was that you couldn't really hear the wave shapes because they kept getting interrupted. So we decided on, let's just listen from Albuquerque. Number one, it's safer. <laughs> uh, but really, it's better because you can actually hear the different waves hit over time, because they t the different waves take different lengths of time to travel through the Earth. So now, so this was one data set, one dimensional data time series. And it looked somewhat, it looked just like this, basically. So the front of it, two minutes worth, is basically a straight line. And they wanted that to come across in the music, that there's no change here. But my intuition also said, well, but there is some interest going on there. If you actually look at the numbers, they're changing up and down. Now look, when you blow it up, they look like this. So I said, OK, let me, let me sonify both. We'll, we'll have a long view of the file that uses the highest or lowest values to scale the pitches so that I get 45 notes from here to here, or roughly from here to here, whichever one's the highest. That's the one I use for the highest pitch or the lowest pitch. And I'm going to play that as an oboe. And then like a jeweler's lens onto the data, you have a zoom lens as a piano sound. And every three seconds, the zoom lens can change. And when it changes, the music tells you it changes by a timpani drum is struck. A lower timpani drum means the numbers are going to get bigger. Now, how do you know how big these numbers are? There's an audio key that goes along with the music that tells you if these numbers are 999, one of these numbers up to 999, in other words, they have three digits in them, you're going to hear three notes out of a scale descending. Ding, 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 ding with a ding sound and a pluck sound, and, and then the timpani when it changes. Now, if these numbers were five, in other words, they went up to 99,000, you'd hear ding, 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 OK? And one ding every second. So the seismic sonata, let's listen a little bit to it. And I'm going to fast forward it. I'm going to listen, we're going to listen a little bit in the beginning, and then I'm going to fast forward it near where, it, where the P waves hit, right here. And then we'll listen a little more, and then I'm going to fast forward it to close to when the S waves hit.
There we go. So the earthquake has already happened. But we're 800 or 1,000 miles away. that they gave me, they actually wanted it cut, they had it cut off here, here and here, pegged out. And that's what they wanted it to sound like, pegged out.
I'm going to end with uh, two selections from this sonification called Solar Songs. This was done for the Space Science Center at the University of New Hampshire. And we were looking at ACE spacecraft data um, generated during April and May of 1998 when they had a particularly exciting uh, active solar wind time. Um, oh, and when you hear the shaker, it means we're going through a, uh, a counter-streaming electron event. That means the electrons are going in and out from the sun, back out and then back into the sun. So when you hear the shaker attached to the sound, it's a counter-streaming event. So we have a little wave, an event, another pause. So I, I'm, I'm imagining a spacecraft, people sitting there and listening, working away. And in the background, they're hearing the results of their the remote sensor data, basically. And they're sitting there. Okay, that was So you get the idea. When it hits the big storm, it's just a mass of music, a mass of sound. I'm going to end tonight with a sonification of the same number of days, but this time we're hearing it in hourly fragments. And we're going to hear the hours ticking by with a marimba sound from 0 to 23, just picking up notes out of a scale, up the scale. And we're going to be listening to multiple parameters. Um, we're going to be hearing DE2. Uh, elect, uh, DE2 is a uh, kilovolt amount uh, related to electrons. DE3 is another one, a higher one. The DE2 are played by a violin. The DE3 are played by a string section. We're going to hear values of iron concentrations as an oboe on the left, left side and then oxygen concentrations as the same sound but over on the right speaker. We're going to be listening to the ratio between the iron and oxygen as a harp. And again, the hours are marimba.
very much.